I'll open with a word of prayer. Well, dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time. We thank you that we can come together in the wonders of the internet and over Zoom. And Lord, just ask that you would be with each and every one of us. Lord, uh, fill us with your spirit and uh, speak to each and every one of us from your scripture. So Lord, give me the words to speak as we delve into uh, Paul's journey to Jerusalem. So tonight we're going to be covering uh, chapters 21, 22, and 23 of the book of Acts. So uh, we're going to semi jump right into it. We're going to pick up some verses. Uh, th this is another chapter break that uh, really is just a continuation from, from the previous chapter. So I decided instead of reviewing the previous chapter, I'd just pick up a couple of verses from the previous chapter and then we'll launch right into uh, Acts chapter 21. So Acts chapter 20, verse 36, uh, we pick up and uh, when, and uh, when he had said these things, that is, you remember, you recall, okay, I'll give a little bit of review. You recall, that Paul was uh, speaking to the elders from the from Ephesus, but he didn't go to Ephesus. He was uh, at a at another another town because the the folks uh, the Jews in the Ephesus would have uh, caused him a lot of trouble. So he calls for the elders and he tells them uh, he gives them some encouragement and he tells them, "Hey, look, I'm I'm going to uh, I'm going to Jerusalem," and uh, so. Uh, uh, anyway, he gives them a one kind of one last teaching. It's as if he, he's not going to see them again, and, and uh, we know that he doesn't. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them, and there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced him and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again, and they accompanied him to the ship. So off he sails to Jerusalem. Okay, chapter 21. And when he had parted from them and set sail, we came by straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patria, as when we had uh, last... Uh, Okay, oh, uh, this is uh, this is a different version, ISV version. It says, as when we had last torn ourselves away from them. Uh, this much more descriptive than, uh, you know, we just departing, we're setting sail, we said our goodbyes. But they had to literally tear themselves away because... Uh, Obviously, the elders wanted more from Paul uh, while he was there, but um, he was determined to head to Jerusalem. So off he sails. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. And when we had come in straight of, uh, when we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed in Tyra. And from there, and the ship was to be to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, and we stayed there for seven days, and through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. So this is the second time the Spirit has uh, is warning Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Paul's biggest mistake of his life, if he hadn't gone to Jerusalem, he would have been imprisoned for two years. He wouldn't have been in prison for two years. So um, it, uh, he gets imprisoned, as we will see, on his uh, journey, not only, I mean, not to Jerusalem, but uh, the, the, the uh, stirring that uh, happens in Jerusalem winds him uh, winds him in prison for a while as we'll uh, get to that okay when our days were when our days there were ended that is seven days we departed and went on our journey and they all with wives and children accompanied us until we were outside the city 
and kneeling down on the bench, we prayed. And, uh, the, the, you know, this is the second time that we see them kneeling and praying. So uh, it's, uh, it's interesting that uh, we learn about that posture here in the latter part of uh, Acts. And said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship and they returned home. And when we and when we had finished the voyage from Tyra, we arrived at Ptolemais, and we gathered the brothers and stayed with them for one day. So always met with Christians. So uh, even in uh, Ptolemais, this is not a place that Paul went to, but uh, there were Christians there, and that was possibly the work of Philip. Um, or possibly converts from Pentecost uh, 26 years earlier. There must have been millions of believers in Rome, in the Roman Empire by the end of the first century. So that's how quick the, uh, the church was growing and spreading. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip, the evangelist. You see? He's an evangelist, and who was one of the seven and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Um, We learned of Agabus in uh, Acts chapter 11, verse 28. In coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So same style of uh, presentation, if you will, that's in Jeremiah. Uh, those chapters there, as well as Isaiah. So this is, uh, the, the Lord is acting kind of in a similar manner here with Paul. Now, you recall, this is the third time that the Spirit is warning Paul. This time, it's a very graphic depiction as to what exactly is going to happen to him. The second time Paul is warned, well, it says the second time, but it's really the third time. Uh, this is the second direct warning uh, that the Spirit has given Paul. And when he heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go, down, go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So it's as if uh, Paul is saying, hey, my ministry is, uh, is over for, for the most part. And so I'm not only willing to be imprisoned, but to, willing to die for the gospel. Uh, of course, as he has uh, written in other, other books as well. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. And Paul, uh, uh, so Paul is quite uh, hard-headed at this point, and he is determined to get to Jerusalem in spite of the Holy Spirit's warning. Um, And after these days, we got ready and we went up to Jerusalem. So there you have it. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of uh, Manson of Cyprus, Uh, an early uh, disciple with whom we should lodge. The uh, original uh, Cypric uh, won on the the day of uh, Pentecost. So this this fellow was one of the uh, 120, or was one that uh, uh, heard the message from Peter uh, during the the first, uh, first day of Pentecost there. Uh, when Peter went out and uh, 3,000, if you recall, were one to the Lord. And when he had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. And on the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all of the elders were present.
After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they had heard it, they glorified God, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law, even though the Jews are free from the law, if they are Christians, they didn't mean that they can't observe it, even though they are no longer under the law. So, uh, of course, being uh, you know being a Christian frees you from the law. Uh, it's not uh, Jesus didn't come to do away with the law, but to complete the law. But even so, the zealous Jews would uh, want. Uh, uh, the Jews to keep the uh, traditions of the of the Jewish people and the traditions of the law, and they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. See, you know, they're going back to Moses again, going back to the law, forsake the law. You don't have to keep the law, and uh, they really have gotten that uh, incorrect telling them not to, not to circumcise their children or walk uh, according to our customs. Well, if you recall, you know, they, were, they were being told not that the, the Gentiles didn't have to be circumcised, but uh, we didn't have any information about uh, Paul uh, saying that they didn't have to be circumcised. And then, uh, and what then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do they do therefore what we tell you? We have four men who are under a vow. That is the Nazarene vow, which is spoken about in uh, November, uh, Numbers uh, chapter 6. Uh, and just a refresher of the vow, 30 days, the last seven in the temple courts, cut hair and burn it as an offering, offer a prescribed offering um, for he lambs on the, the uh, first year, of the first year. So that's the uh, Nazarene vow. And the, so these four men were going to be cutting their hair and burning it and making the offering. Uh, this was an expensive process. It took a, a loss of trade for a week plus the offering sponsorship deemed praiseworthy. So they were asking, in effect, Paul to sponsor these four guys uh, to win favor, if you will, with the, uh, with the Jewish court. Uh, take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. It must have been very expensive to shave heads back then because they needed, <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> uh, sometimes the scripture is, uh, is pretty interesting, isn't it? Thus all <laughs> will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourselves also live in obedience of the law. So there you go. They want uh, Paul to continue with the law, which I'm sure he probably, you know, he probably was. Uh, but they want wanted an outward sign that Paul would actually be, um, uh, you know, reassuring uh, folks that he actually observed the law. The leader suggested that Paul demonstrate publicly his reverence for the Jewish law, and uh, they asked uh, all they asked was that he identify himself with the four men under the Nazarene vow. Pay their sacrifice and be with them in the temple for the time of the purification. He agreed to do it. Okay. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual sexual immorality so this is this is just a repeat of uh, earlier 
um, when uh, James uh, basically dictated, wrote a letter uh, saying that the, the Gentiles don't have to be circumcised, but um, to abstain from basically idol worship is what it was. Then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. Uh, this was a mistake for Paul to participate in, well, I guess the question is, is this a mistake for Paul to participate in this procedure? Uh, this was going to draw attention to him, of course, but as as the other guys were saying, look, you know, this is, this is probably a good thing for you because you want to assure them that you're still a Jew at heart. So Paul is still a Jew and accompanying this is a ritualistic uh, customary thing. Um, so he was just doing his Jewish thing. And when the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him. So, you know, here we go. Here we go. And it may have been from Ephesus and from other areas that uh, the, um, you know, Iacon and, and those places, the Jews from Asia, again, uh, are stirring things up. It, you know, it's not enough that the Jews in Jerusalem are stirring them up, but it's the visitors from out of town that are stirring things up, crying out, men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought the Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Well, he did not bring Greeks. These weren't Greeks. These were Jews. And so, uh, you know, the, these guys were really stirring things up because, uh, after all, they didn't understand what was going on. And, of course, they didn't understand the way. And uh, they hadn't had the Damascus Road experience that, uh, you know, Paul, Saul had had. And so... Uh, here we go. They're going to uh, really stir things up. And, and, and actually, they're stirring up the whole town, it sounds like. For they had previously seen uh, Throphemus and the Ephesian. See, he's from, uh, they, they thought that Paul was uh, bringing this Ephesian, uh, Throphemus, who, uh, who was a Greek, with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple, which, of course, Paul did not. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together, and they seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. So this, uh, this little thing that's happening in Jerusalem and at the temple is, uh, you know, very similar to what's happening today. Uh, we could almost say similar things are happening and falsehoods are being proclaimed and uh, uh, people are being stirred up. Isn't that interesting? Uh, whatever go goes around comes around. And here we are again with this type of situation. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tri uh, tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. Uh, whenever you see confusion, you should uh, that that should trigger something in your mind. It triggers something in my mind. It triggers something that hey, you know, the enemy is really stirring things up. God is not a god of confusion. It's the enemy who is the god, who is, uh, if you will, the little god of confusion. He is the one that's behind this, of course. Um, uh, so. Uh, uh, he uh, he at once uh, he at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them, and when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped uh, they stopped beating Paul. So Paul was being beaten up here. I mean, they were so angry and so confused and so they they just were, you know, just beating him up. Uh, so Claudius uh, Elias the, was the chief uh, captain uh, at that time and at that place. Uh, 
Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he he inquired who he was and what he had done. So that is the um, the captain inquired who he was and what he had done. And some of the crowd were shouting one thing and some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, uh, sounds similar as of A, uh, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks or the, the uh, catacombs, if you will, or the, being uh, um, a, uh, thrown into prison, basically, is what's being happening here. And when he had come to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. So Paul was kind of sickly anyway, and now he's not in very good shape after this crowd got to him. For the mob of the people followed, crying out, away with him. So they, the mob wanted to kill him, uh, basically. And uh, they were on that, uh, of that mindset to do that very thing. And Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, and he said to the tribune, may I say something to you? I mean, can you imagine what Paul was about to say here? May I say something? He said, do you know Greek? Um, are you not the Egyptian then who was recently stirring up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the Assyrians out into the wilderness? So they are, um, you know, they're kind of confused there. And Paul replied, I am a Jew from Tarsus in uh, Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. So they may be getting an idea that uh, this Paul is actually a Roman citizen. And when he had given his permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when there, and when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying, uh, Paul would have yielded his uh, salvation for them. I mean, this is, uh, you can find that in Romans uh, 3. He, uh, you know, would give up his salvation to bring yet just one into the kingdom of God. I mean, we should have such a, such a heart. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they had heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, and they became even more quiet, and he said, I am a Jew born in Tarshish in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, that is the, the great teacher Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law, of our fathers being zealous for God as all of you are this day. So he's identifying with the crowd and saying, look, I'm a teacher of the teachers. I was, brought, I was educated by the most educated and, and greatest teacher of, uh, of our time. And uh, so therefore, uh, you know, uh, let's hold things a little bit here. Uh, Tarsus was actually the center of Greek learning of that day. The finest Greek university in Paul's day was in Tarsus, not in Athens or in Corinth, which had passed their zenith by that time. So Tarsus was a thriving Greek city and an educational center, and uh, Paul was essentially educated at the best of the best. Paul's sister lived in Jerusalem, and uh, may have reared her uh, younger brother. Um, that you can get a hint of that in Acts 5. Uh, Rabin Gabaniel uh, I was the president of the council uh, after the death of his own father, Rabin, Rabin Sim, Simeon, son of Hillel. Paul's master, 35, 35th uh, receive, receiver of uh, the tradition. So uh, just a little of the, of the lineage and of the teacher th that uh, Paul had, uh, was getting instruction from. 
I persecuted the way to the death. So now he's coming out and saying, look, you know, I was doing like you, uh, but only more zealous, with more zealous. Binding and delivering to the prison both men and women, and as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear, bear me witness, for them I received letters to the brothers, and I joined, I journeyed towards Damascus to take those also who were there and bringing them in bounds to Jerusalem to punish, in bonds to Jerusalem. So you remember the situation earlier in Acts, and uh, Paul was uh, very zealous, and he, he got uh, letters from the council to uh, basically go into uh, these um, these other other cities, uh, Damascus being one of them, to um, bring out the way from uh, there and bring them to to uh, Jerusalem. Notice that Paul calls it this way, um, not the way, this way again. He doesn't mention the church or the followers of Christ or Christians. He uses the term which they and he understood. So um, the, uh, it was, uh, in, especially in Jerusalem, uh, the Christians were called the way, as you recall, uh, when uh, Paul was doing all this persecution. And I was on my way, not, the, not this way or that way, but he was on his way and drew near to Damascus. About noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone upon me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So he's uh, describing the exact situation that he found himself in as, uh, of course, the Damascus Road experience. And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, who you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. So follows chapter 9 account uh, pretty much perfectly. Paul was, uh, was sought. He did not seek Christ. Uh, so, you know, some of us uh, seek after Christ, but uh, in essence, we are all sought by the Holy Spirit. Uh, through the prayers of the saints, if you will. There is no contradiction to uh, uh, 9 verse 7 at all. The men heard a voice, they heard the sound, but they did not understand what the words, uh, what the voice said. And as I said, what shall I do, Lord? And, and I said, what shall I do, Lord? The Lord said to me, rise and go to, to Damascus, and there will be uh, told all, and there you will be told all that is, uh, is appointed for you to do. Um, almost the uh, ex exact situation that, that took place. And since I could not see because of the brightness of the light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into me. Now, you recall, I mean, it was, yes, it was a bright light, but he had scales over his eyes that actually fell off when Ananias came to him. And one Ananias, a devoted man, according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there. Notice he's not saying Ananias is a Christian or is not part of the way. He's just saying that hey, uh, this man, Ananias, came to him. He was a very devout man, and he was, uh, you know, he walked according to the law and is very well respected. Came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour, I received my sight and saw him. And well, the scales fell off of him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. So appointed implies uh, foreknowledge or predestination. So God of our fathers, fathers appointed you, so predestined Paul, if you will, um, to uh, uh, not only receive Christ, but um, uh, the, uh, the, the terminology, if you will, the, the, the righteous one, and it's uh, called 
other things and in other translations, but the righteous one appears seven times in scripture title for the Messiah. So he was, uh, he was saying to them that the, the this Lord that he was talking to that struck him down with the bright light was the Messiah indeed. So there was no um, arguing that uh, you know Paul was think, talking about somebody else. For you will be witnesses for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? You see that? He set them up. He set them up. He's inviting them to be to receive uh, the Lord Jesus. And uh, uh, he is uh, telling them to, ra- to rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Well, his name is Jesus implies that it was very necessary for Paul to be baptized in order to be saved, but that's not at all the case. Saul washed away his sins by calling on the name of Jesus. So the order here is a little little, uh, confusing, but indeed you call on the name of Jesus, you accept the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved from that point on. And of course, baptism is just an an outward uh, um, agreement, if you will, with your the, the confession that you made that, that Jesus is Lord. He's calling on the Lord uh, preceded his baptism. And when I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and uh, saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. So <laughs> this was back when, of course, you know, uh, Paul was, uh, um, you know, after he received um, the message directly from the Lord, um, he's being told this. And and I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned, I was imprisoned and beat, uh, I was beat uh, those who were, who believed in you. Um, and when the blood of Stephen, uh, you, your witness was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the gamma, the garments of those who killed him. And when he said to me, go for, I will send you far away to the Gentiles up to this word, they listened to him. Okay, so Stephen, yep, okay, we we can, you know, Stephen was obviously a, a bold preacher of the way, and so killing him, yep, okay, that sounds right, uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, he's talking about going, I will send you far away to the Gentiles to preach to the Gentiles, uh-uh, that's anti-Jewish, you know, in a sense. Uh, up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth. In other words, kill him. He should not be allowed to live. Um, well, th- that ended <laughs> uh, the uh, accommodation of the mob. Uh, they will hear no longer, hear him no longer. Um, they were patient uh, for a little bit, uh, but then... Uh, when he said uh, the things that he said, obviously about the Messiah and uh, the Lord talking to him, that uh, this is and going to the Gentiles, uh, like I said, was uh, was a, a great no no. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and uh, flinging dust into the air, the tri- the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks basically for his own safety, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. So Centurion probably did not understand Aramaic, so he was confused. If a riot damaged property, he would be held responsible. If he were proven negligent, he would lose his post. 
and uh, not only lose his post in some instances actually lose his life so he had to keep order um in this uh, in this situation so he was uh, going to take uh, paul away but when they had uh, stretched him out uh, for the whips so they were about ready to give him a flogging paul said to the centurion who was standing by is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? So this is a problem. <laughs> like before, you know, a, a Roman cannot, uh, you know, flog a Roman citizen without being, without being charged. And of course, he wasn't being charged. And when the centurion he heard this, he went to the tribune and said to them, what are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. An edict from uh, Caesar Augustus stipulated that all Roman citizens were, void, were to be ex expected uh, exempt from flogging. All Roman citizens were, be, were to be exempt from flogging. And here he was about to flog Paul and that prior to any trial before a magistrate, a formal charge had to be made against them, and any official permitting such flogging would, was publicly executed. So now, not only would he lose his post, he would have, lo he would have lost his life if he had gone, gone through with this. So the tribune came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, yes. The tribune answered, I brought this citizenship for a, I bought this citizenship for a large sum, Paul said, but I am a citizen by birth. Well, Paul's parents had been Roman citizens and it became inherent. Uh, so uh, he would, he inherited the right of, uh, of being, uh, but by the fact that he was a descendant. Um, in uh, 171 BC, when Tarsus became a free city, many of its prominent citizens were awarded citizenship, and uh, Paul's parents could have been indeed prominent citizens. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately, and the tribune also was afraid for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had uh, bound him. So we've got uh, problems in River City, if you will. But on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the, the chief priest and all of the council to meet, and he brought Paul down and set him before them. So this Roman uh, citizen, if you will, brings this other Roman citizen, Paul, in front of the, uh, the priest, the chief priest, and say, hey, what's going on here? And looking intently at the council, Paul said, brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good circumstances uh, up to this day. Uh, on an all good conscience uh, up to this day. And the high priest Ananias uh, commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Uh, brothers was an offense uh, to them uh, to call himself a brother um, was, uh, was an offense. And uh, the fifth time there is a defense of Christ to the, this is the fifth time there's a defense uh, of uh, Christ to the Sanhedrin, as we will see. Then Paul said to them, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed walls. There you have it. Um, a little bit of Paul's character, uh, a little bit of, uh, you know, he held nothing back. He was zealous and he was bold. Uh, we should be so bold, um, and uh, especially when we're confronting evil and confronting uh, heretics as, uh, as he's doing here. Um, are you sitting to judge me according to the law, and you yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? So the law itself says that he couldn't be struck without being charged, and here you go. 
they are, uh, you know, they're actually striking him. And of course, we know the uh, the priest, uh, since they did what they did to uh, Jesus, uh, they uh, are going to do it to one of his uh, his disciples here as well. Whitewashed wall, calling him a grave, basically, is what that's referring to. A barefaced uh, hypocrite. In other words, uh, you were you were you're white on the outside, and Jesus used this, but you're nothing but uh, filled with bones and uh, dead stuff on the inside, and that's indeed uh, what they were. Prophecy fulfilled according to uh, Josephus, and Ananias later dragged from a sewer in which he was hiding and killed by an assassin's dagger. So Ananias here, this Ananias, uh, the chief priest uh, yeah, suffered a little bit of uh, consequence because of what it, what happened to uh, to Paul here. Those who stood by said, "Would you revile God's high priest?" And Paul said, "I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak e evil of a ruler of your people.'" And uh, now, uh, when Paul perceived that, that one part was Sanhedrin and the other part was Pharisees, he cried out in the council, brothers, he is the brothers again, which they love to hear him say, brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the, the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. So uh, now this little uh, passage here with regard to the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, um, you, you recall from um, you know earlier chapters uh, when we got into Sadducees and Pharisees that the Sadducees were the liberals of the group and they did not believe in angels or uh, the Holy Spirit, but the these uh, Pharisees did. So Paul at least uh, Saul, when Paul was Saul, he at least believed in the angels. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadd Sadducees, and the assembly was divided, as Paul was expecting to divide them. <laughs> Paul's a clever guy. I mean, you know, he's uh, he's causing a little bit of division here because they're, after all, they're whitewashed uh, sepulchres, if you will. And for the Sadducees uh, say that there is no resurrection, nor angels, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Uh, so, um, you know, the Sadducees are sad, you see, because they, uh, anyway, that's an old joke. Paul turns the trial into a uh, theological argument between the fundamentalists and the liberals. So the fundamentalists being the Pharisees uh, and the liberals, of course, being the Sadducees. This is easy to do. They uh, never has been a time when you couldn't get these two groups at each other's throat. Does that sound familiar? I think so. I think that's exactly what we're seeing today. <laughs> then a great uh, clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply, we find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? We, you know, that, what's wrong with that? I mean, I would like an angel to speak to me like that. I mean, come on, what's wrong? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, after that, uh, the, uh, after that, Paul would be torn to pieces by them, afraid that the, the, the tribune, the, afraid, the, uh, the one who's in charge of Paul at this point, was afraid that, tar, that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bringing him to the barracks. So this is the last, the last sermon that Paul would preach in Jerusalem, never again to set foot in the city of David. And this is the ter third time the Romans rescue Paul. Um, so, uh, yeah, Paul is, 
he's he's got himself in a bit of a, a bit of a bind, but of course he was forewarned by the Holy Spirit uh, about uh, about this. So the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, "Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify as in Rome." So who is speaking to Paul? He's in the he's in the barracks. He's in prison essentially. The Lord himself is talking to Paul, and he's saying, take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. So uh, Paul's takeaway message here is that Paul is going to Rome, and that, um, you know, even though folks in uh, Jerusalem and other places want to kill him, he's going to make it all the way to Rome. So this was probably the darkest night of Paul's life. No prayer meeting. Uh, there's no nobody accompanying Paul. There's no Silas. There's no Barnabas. There's no uh, no one else, uh, you know, uh, accompanying Paul or Timothy or anybody else. He's there alone, and uh, so there's no peer, uh, uh, prayer meeting. And unlike Peter's uh, imprisonment in Acts chapter twelve, um, he, he wasn't going to be set free uh, by some miraculous angel coming by and rattling the, uh, the, the, the prison doors, if you will, and unshackling him. The Lord stood by him, judged in faithfulness, uh, not by success. So, um, well, you know, he was, he was warned, but here he is. And um, he is to spend two years in prison in Caesarea. When he arrives in Rome, he is to spend another three years. So uh, this is the last five years of Paul's life, basically. When it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. So this is serious business here. They were really out to get Paul and uh, to uh, to kill him. Um, and I don't know if they were going to stone him like Paul did with Stephen, but uh, they were certainly out to get him. Now, uh, there were more than 40 who made this uh, uh, conspiracy. And they went to the chief priests and the elders and said, we have strictly bound ourselves by an oath <clears throat> to taste no food until we have killed Paul. Now, therefore, among the council, give notice to the tribune, that is the, the local sheriff, if you will, to bring him down to you as though you were going to determine his case more exactly. So here's the plot, and uh, we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So they are plotting, they're, they're telling uh, basically the, the uh, Sanhedrin, the council, the priest, to um, uh, call, call for Paul and to, to, to lie to them uh, that they're going to try to figure out what is going on here. Um, now the son of Paul's sister heard of this ambush, so he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Now, is this a coincidence that the son of Paul's sister heard this? I don't think so. There's no such thing as a coincidence in the Jewish um, <clears throat> Jewish language, or <laughs> or uh, you know, in this in this particular case. So, um, you know, the Lord was indeed looking out for him because had he gone, he would have been uh, killed for sure. Now, Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the tribune for he has something to tell him. So in other words, take him to the, to the, uh, uh, to the chief of police uh, and uh, this young man has something to say. Uh, Junia may have been Paul's sister. Uh, what a coincidence that Paul's nephew was able to hear, of course. And Jesus has already comforted him that he would be preaching in, uh, in Rome. So, um, you know, you got to think what, what was on Paul's mind at this point, because uh, this, is, uh, this is something else. So he took him. And he brought him to the tribune and said, he took the young man, not Paul, 
Paul, the prisoner, called me and asked me to bring this young man to you as he has something to say to you. And the tribune took him by the hand, took him by the hand. So you wonder how young this young fellow was. Uh, it kind of suggests that by taking him by the hand, he's, uh, he's quite young. And, and going aside, asked him privately, what is this that you have to tell me? So um, if a Roman citizen was murdered, the consequences would be grave, would be grave indeed if, uh, uh, under the charge of uh, the chief, um, if you will, chief of police. And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire somewhat more closely about him. But do not be persuaded by them, for more than 40 of their men are lying in ambush for him who have bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are already waiting for your consent. So the tribune dismissed the young man, charging him to no one till no one that you have informed me of these things. So um, in other words, keep quiet. Um, I'll take care of things. Then he called two of the centurions and said, get ready 200, so 200 soldiers with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night. So basically in the middle of the night, uh, you're going to take this guy and uh, you're going to lead him out of town safely. And he's going to be in the middle of a big crowd of uh, soldiers. So the garrison at uh, Antonia, approximately a thousand men. Paul's dispatchment was 200 in infantry, 700 of the, I mean, 70 of the cavalry and 200 spearmen. So that eight equals 400, 470. That's a good percentage. That's almost half of uh, the garrison that was, uh, that was there. Also uh, provide uh, mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. So uh, provide mounts. He's going to put uh, Paul on a horse because Paul is not in good shape at this point in time, as you recall. And um, so uh, he's, he's going to take care of him. And he wrote a letter to, to this effect. Claudius uh, Lysias to His Excellency the Governor Felix. Greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when I came upon them with, a, uh, with the soldiers and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman citizen and desiring to know the charge for which they were accusing him. I brought him down to, the, to their council. The captain in uh, Jerusalem wants the governor in Caesarea to know that he was performing his duties appropriately by protecting a Roman citizen. I found that he was being accused about questions of their law, but charged with nothing deserving death or, uh, or imprisonment. And when it was disclosed to me, so why didn't he just let him go? is, you know, is the question. Why didn't he just determine that there's nothing here to see, uh, you know, just to drive Paul out of town and say, you know, good riddance, don't come back again. <laughs> and when it was disclosed to me that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to state before you what they have against him. It is clear that Claudius uh, Lysias never did know exactly what the charge was against Paul. He knew it pertained to the law. That's the only information that uh, that he's getting, at least from this letter, and the accusers don't, uh, don't follow him. So the soldiers, according to their instructions, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. Antip 
And on the next day, they returned to the barracks, letting the horsemen go on with him. And when they had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they presented Paul also before him. So they presented Paul to Felix, to them. And reading the letter, he asked what province he was from. And when he had learned that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will give you a hearing when your accusers arrive. So when are the accusers going to arrive? Well, it took years. And he commanded him to be guarded in Herod's uh, uh, Praetorium. Paul waits for his accusers on his way to Rome. So uh, eventually Paul's going to petition to go to Rome, uh, as we'll see in the subsequent chapters. So that ends our study for today. Uh, next time we'll look at uh, chapters 24, 25, and 26. And that's uh, defense of, um, of uh, defense before Paul's defense before Felix. Uh, he has two, uh, two defenses, if you will. Um, that took, a, as I said before, that took two years. So he was in Caesarea for two years. And then uh, the defense then the before Festus uh, appeal, uh, he's, uh, that's when he's going to appeal to Caesar. And then the, for, the defense uh, before um, Agrippa. Um, so we're going to be getting to those in chapters 24 and 26. And with that, let's close with a word of prayer. So dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for your precision of the word. We thank you that it really brings a word picture to us as to the events that are happening to Paul. And uh, Paul was so set on going to Jerusalem only to be beaten and uh, to be uh, actually wanting to be killed, but he was forewarned multiple times about that. So Lord, um, may we also be, be forewarned if we're in certain similar situations, uh, but like Paul, be able to speak boldly uh, to not only our accusers, but to those around us about your scripture and more importantly about you, Jesus, and who you really are. So Lord, uh, give us the words to speak uh, to those around us, to the lost, and uh, let us not shrink back just because they may uh, not necessarily agree with us. It's not our responsibility, of course, to... Um, to force somebody into acknowledging who you are and believing in you. It's the work of your Holy Spirit. So all we need to do is just obey the word when you say speak. So Lord, make it absolutely perfectly clear when we are to speak and even give us the words as to how, uh, how to speak. So Lord, we just lift this up. We lift our week to you and we pray, uh, pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.